¿Me escuchan todos? Can you all hear? Okay. Okay, Perfect. is my voice coming eh, through? Great. Ya, lo siento. Bueno, mi charla es que I'm going to talk about the importance of cul the cultural context for evidence-based uh, decision-making in the political arena, but that also involves science. We will see the relationship between politics and uh, science, as uh, you heard, I'm a doctor, so the scientific method is quite familiar to me. And I also worked in public policy and in the government, so I am really familiar with the operation of political structures and how decisions are made in those structures. So, the content of the talk um, is in line with the proposals of the Psygaze movement. When you go into the movement's website, you can drill down the menu and you will learn that there are six main components in the Z movement model, automation of employment, prior giving priority to access over uh, ownership, um, the uh, system of uh, production for localized uh, self-content as independent as possible. And at the same time, you have the unification of the Earth through technological systems. So you have to be as efficient as possible. Then we have the scientific method as a governance system. And we will move away from markets and we will leave aside money. So, in my presentation, I do not intend to address all the elements of this model because I don't have enough time, but I'm going to talk about the scientific method as a governance system. Why do I focus on this if I have worked in both fields, on both sides? Okay. <laughs> We have always talked about the scientific method as a governance methodology in the movement uh, with the analogy of a plane. There is no Republican or Democrat way for the plane to fly. There is only one way that has to be used, otherwise the planes will come down. So science can provide answers for resource management. So, is it like this? Is science uh, really a governance system? Here we have a quote from the website. The application of the scientific method for social welfare is a highly repeated mantra as a pillar of social operation in a resource-based economy. Although the evidence relates to the industry, it is enough to understand that evidence. It is also important to realize its value in relation to human behavior. So what do we mean by this governance principle? There is a dual approach on, on industry and human behavior. So this is about understanding that science can help us uh, determine how to manage the industry, the macroeconomic factors in general, and human behavior will allow us to deal with the microeconomic elements. So these are the items inside the six component of the Z model. So Peter says that it is very easy to apply this analogy of the plane to the macroeconomic aspect. You can have 30 uh, cows in Argentina, you can divide it across the world, you can plant a banana here. So that is something that doesn't seem to be so complex. The question is how do we manage microeconomics as a scientific system? And it is here where I have found some limitations in the scientific method for dealing with microeconomics. And microeconomics has to do with how individuals, economic agents, uh, in this case the physicians, respond to decision-making in the economy. 
Let me give you several examples. So you go to a hospital, you, uh, a child needs a transfusion, but the parents are Jehovah's uh, Witnesses, and so and they refuse to give a, transfusion, a blood transfusion to their son. Then you may have a TB patient who doesn't want to remain in hospital. And this is a dilemma. Why? Because TB is a global problem. It is a disease that is very difficult to eradicate. You require uh, treatment with uh, multiple antibiotics uh, to avoid uh, the infectious uh, transmission. And you have to take um, many uh, drugs um, for a long period of time. Usually, TB affects uh, poor areas. And perhaps poor people have to walk for two hours to get to the hospital. So you have to trust that they are going to comply with the treatment. And if the patient goes to the hospital, uh, or doesn't want to go to a hospital, how would you make sure that that uh, patient is in hospital or receives treatment? Should you take him to prison? And then we have vaccination. Let's think about a free society. In a free society, people can choose whether to get vaccinated or not. But if 95% of them do not get the vaccine, then the vaccine will not be effective, right? So, when it comes to microeconomic elements, there are various considerations that we need to make. So, the question is, how can science approach these issues? How can we make decisions on the basis of science? The purpose of this presentation is precisely to show you how science is currently working in order to provide answers in a variety of situations. People tend to think that the scientific-based uh, governance is uh, uh, a utopia, but we, this is actually happening in practice, and uh, it is important to be aware of the limitations and also of the challenges that might uh, be associated with this model. I am going to talk specifically about the evidence-based uh, decision-making process in the healthcare field, because that is the one that I'm most familiar with. But uh, the starting point is the US Congress. This is a quote. The technical information required by those that uh, make decisions and make policies is usually not available or is not in the proper form. They, that is what they say. We have information, but not the information in the format required. A politician cannot judge the merits or consequences of a technological problem within an strictly technical context. The politician has to consider social, economic, and legal implications of any course of action. And this is how an HTA unit was uh, associated, uh, was created in order to give advice to Congress people about the different ethical dilemmas uh, they may, and challenges and the logistic uh, problems they may encounter when they are trying to uh, make decisions in the field of health care. So this is the name that we give them. Health technology assessment. So. As you can see, we have several dimensions in this cycle. This is a quick example. If I am told that a patient has a, a dystrophy, that is, uh, the muscles have some genetic defects, so they are quite weak, remember that uh, muscles allow your blood uh, to run and um, you make possible that you breathe. So you may have um, medication that might work or not. And then you may wonder whether you need to buy that drug. Perhaps the drug works, but it will only extend your survival for three months. So should I pay all the costs for the patient to live just three months? If we live as an economy, um, I might say, should I invest all resources for this patient to live three months? Is this socially acceptable? And then I'm going to give you a few examples of the different scales. Then, compatibility, organizational compatibility, and ethical considerations. 
So, this is my preliminary conclusion. Currently, science is applied for decision-making, but not in a systematic way in all decision-making processes by the government and not in all governments. So this has this also relates to what can be done in the field of climate change and when governments need to make decisions. So, but sometimes the government processes are much slowly. So let me present a case. This is something from real life. I'm not making up this case. I have a problem. And the problem is that there is a lot of uh, HIV in Indonesia. You know that this gives you AIDS and then people die. Indonesia is a uh, a group of islands, 17,000 islands distributed across 5,200 kilometers. These are all islands. 252 million inhabitants with 360 ethnic groups and 700 languages and dialects. Okay. This is one of the few places where AIDS has been on the rise in the last few years instead of dropping. 50% of the population don't know what AIDS is. That is the situation they live in. And you have the largest Muslim population there. 80 to 90 percent of Muslims uh, live in Indonesia. Did you know that? So, I have a lot of technologies or interventions to use. I can have flyers, I can distribute condoms, I can also distribute antiretroviral drugs, I can pr provide vaccines, I can also give talks to people who are engage in sexual intercourse uh, at high levels of risk. And so some of these resources will be required, like vaccines, because they will have, uh, they will be immunodepressed. But will this work? That is the question. And here there are two key concepts that I want you to remember. Whenever we do science, we make tests with the best possible methods in on a specific population group. So here, if we are talking about gift, the gift society, you are exactly like the uh, general population. So that has to do with transferability. The second concept here is applicability. So, you can start providing goods and services, you can uh, distribute food, you can do translation. So, you, this can also be um, uh, associated with surgeries. This is uh, exactly, it's exactly the same applicable concept. So, transferability has to do with the characteristics of the target population. And when you run a clinical trial, you may have a study population where all the patients are the same, but all of them are different. Here, you have a standardized method. I pay a physician for, to make sure that there is this standardization, but perhaps the nurse takes over and she doesn't do it the same way. In the lab, you may follow all gold standard uh, processes, but sometimes in reality, that, that is not necessary the case. And in the field of social sciences, we have a similar situation. In social sciences, and this is a professor from a university who realized that most of the studies had been conducted on weird people those people who are called weird. So psychologists from top universities carry out this test among their own colleagues because they have to come up with a thesis. So most of them are from a Western origin. They are educated. They live in industrialized countries. They are rich, and they live in democratic countries. So this is, turns into an important limitation when you want to transfer this to others population groups. So the second preliminary conclusion is that scientific method does create knowledge, but this knowledge has a limited direct applicability. So in terms of applicability, these are some of the key questions that people may ask themselves when they are trying to assess a specific project. So let me go back to the example 
of Indonesia. What is the political environment of the local society like? Does it allow you to implement this intervention? Indonesia was under a military dictatorship government for many years with a lot of fragmentation with different castes, different groups that had been ignored in deliberately. So, the local society and the political environment are the uh, key players here. Is there any political barrier to implement this intervention? So, can this result in the death of some people? Will the general public and the target population accept this intervention? And I'm being serious because a lot of people don't want to go to the healthcare facilities because uh, being in contact with physicians is a synonym of being sick, so they try to avoid that kind of situation. Is that ethically acceptable? This is quite fun because um, Whenever I was studying, this question was raised. Uh, would you accept 10 people from Africa telling you in the US how uh, things should be managed? So people would laugh at, uh, at this question. But uh, actually, many people do that in, in many contexts. So is this ethically acceptable? You need to address also the ethical considerations. Then, can the contents of the intervention be adapted to the local culture? How do you think that this kind of program was implemented in Indonesia? It was implemented through religious groups. The religious groups started persuading people of uh, starting new habits, looking after themselves, and also taking care of their health. Another important question, are essential resources available to implement this intervention in the local context? It is not just a matter of having free resources or not. There are many international organizations that have a lot of resources they can give for free. Take condoms, take these drugs. Um, they are desperate to get people to use them, but that is not the only option. So in this case, another consideration is to look whether we have the essential resources and we have uh, the right distribution method. In some places, we have seen that this is applicable to urban centers, but perhaps not so much to rural centers, because in rural centers, there is a system of distribution that is not efficient. But we will continue to have this kind of environment. So, what about the level of schooling, of education of the population group? I think that this is quite clear. Do they have the necessary level of schooling? And is the organization that will be, take care of providing this intervention capable of uh, doing this? Is there any obstacle, any barrier that could prevent the implementation of this intervention due to the structure of the organization? And uh, if there is no supplier for this intervention, will there be any training available? So I have covered the questions that people ask themselves when they are assessing a specific intervention. So. Here we have another preliminary conclusion. There are some significant limitations in the scientific method as a governance method. Let me go back some slides. When I started talking about applicability. In this presentation, I had a dual purpose. If you are activists of the Z movement and if you are going to submit a project to the government, because in 2023 the government is going to choose a project and they are uh, willing to accept you at their office and they are willing to take your project and they will tell you, we'll do whatever you want, you will be given as many resources as you need, I'm going to give you just a small time to work on. So let's have this transition. So you start being asked all those questions. So let's move ahead with the questions. 
¿Otra vez? ¿Y otra vez? Entonces tenemos respuestas. So we have answers. And cuando, this is the message that I want to convey to you whenever you think about any siguiente. type of transition. Y otra vez. Bueno, entonces, ¿qué significa so, esto? what do we mean by this? Siguiente. A ver, lo, lo que significa es que nosotros this means that we can only make decisions on the basis of the best available evidence, but we will always be needing more evidence. And this is happening right now, and it will continue to happen in the best case scenario. We will always have incomplete information, but that doesn't mean that the system will collapse. There are limitations in the scientific method as a governance method, but that doesn't mean that the method is not functional. So, this is a definition by the Z movement. Who is going to be in charge of the system? So the answer is, uh, it is a collaborative design system based on public interaction facilitated by free access uh, planned system. What is important here, this phrase, public interaction, because when we get to the limit of the evidence available, somebody will have to make a decision. Usually, those are the stakeholders that may be affected, either if they make a decision or if they make no decision. So, look at this chart. This is how HTA takes place. These are steps that bring together science with the multiple stakeholders. And this is how a governance model can be managed. This is not um, um, out of reality. So first, you have to define the objectives and the scope of the evaluation. Then you look at the possibility of having ethical plans. Otherwise, you meet with experts and you determine who will be affected by this implementation, then you ask yourself whether you have the capabilities to perform this analysis. Once you are ready, you start with the evaluations, the ethical, resource management assessment, capabilities assessment, and then you have a discussion with experts and with the stakeholders. You review the data. So what you have here outside is like a checklist. And finally, you transfer knowledge to the field where you are going to apply this intervention. And the conclusion is that there are roles that robots will not be able to undertake, because no matter how good the robot is, sometimes the robot will have no basis uh, for its predictions. So this is all that I had to share with you. I had very little time. I understand that we don't have a Q&A session now. But at the end of the panel, all of us will be outside in case you have any questions. This is my email address and my social media account if you want to follow me. And this is all that I had to share with you. Thank you for your attention. And I want to thank the organizers for allowing me to be here today.